Good evening and welcome to Chicago Music Poster History Workshop. I'm Jeannie Long, Executive Director of Chicago Collections Consortium. And for those of you who are new to Chicago Collections, we are a consortium comprised of libraries, museums, and cultural heritage organizations, all working together for the preservation, promotion, and sharing of Chicago's rich history and culture. We do this through the sharing of member archival collections on CCC's free and open access portal, Explore Chicago Collections. We encourage you to visit Chicago's Collections website at chicagocollections.org, not only to check out the portal, but also to join our mailing list and be sure to follow us on social media. Also on CCC's website, you'll find the listing of additional free public programs like the one being offered here tonight. We'd like to acknowledge the Terra Foundation of American Art for their generous support of tonight's program, which is being presented as part of Art Design Chicago Now, an initiative funded by the Terra Foundation for American Art that amplifies the voices of Chicago's diverse creatives, past and present, and explores the essential role they play in shaping the now. Please check out Terra's website for additional information on their program and events. I'd like to begin tonight's conversation by thanking Jay Ryan, Steve Albini for joining us tonight and a special thank you to tonight's moderator, Kevin Leonard, Northwestern University's archivist and co-chair of Chicago Collections Content Committee. Kevin, let's get the conversation started. Jeannie, thank you for the kind introduction for today's program, for telling us about the fine work of Chicago Collections. I also am grateful for the participation of today's guests, Jay Ryan and Steve Albini. It is a privilege for me to be able to speak with them, and I know it will be a pleasure for our audience to learn about their work. Let me thank all of you in the audience for your interest in Jay and Steve, for your implied interest in the documentary record that they have created and continue to create. Jay and Steve are witnesses to history and makers of history, and they are also representative of a broader community of artists and musicians and recording engineers who very colorfully mark and measure the time in which we live. And with that, I thank you for your time and for your willingness to engage with people who are doing significant work. We're here today for a few reasons, to learn about Chicago graphics and music, visual and auditory art, and in particular, the intersection of those two fields through the creation of concert or gig posters. Our region boasts a very talented, accomplished and lively collection of artists and musicians. We have with us today, two of the most recognized and esteemed among them. I deliberately use the word collection because I want to emphasize that the sponsor of our program, Chicago Collections Consortium, represents a large group of area institutions eager to secure records of significance to social, political, economic, and cultural history, including expression in art and music. Jay and Steve, we recognize what you do, and some of us need to speak with you about ensuring the future availability of the material that you create and that document uh, the, the, the lives that you live. Jay Ryan is a musician and artist who created in 1999 the Bird Machine Print Shop. Jay learned screen printing beginning in 1995 from Steve Walters, founder of Screwball Press and Screwball Academy, a program which has trained many prominent printers. Some of you in the audience no doubt saw Tuesday's program, which included very talented local printers, including Jay and Steve, Alex Pataki of High Lonesome Print, and Thomas Lucas of Hummingbird Press Editions. Jay's business and his stature have grown. He is one of the most acclaimed printers in the nation. His work is instantly recognizable, uh, magnificently, magnificently collectible, and you've seen it, bank squirrels, raccoons, bicycles, bison, dinosaurs, rabbits, and Sisyphus. Much of that work is available as well in three published books, Animals In and Out of Water, no one told me not to do this, and 101 posters, 134 squirrels. Jay, thank you for being here. Thank you. Originally from Montana, Steve Albini is an alumnus of Northwestern University, which I note because it is the institution at which I am employed. And I can speak from personal memory, made a name for himself through art and music, dating back at least as far as his college years. He is a musician, bass guitar, who has performed in some very noteworthy bands, and as a prominent recording engineer, founded, owns, and operates Electrical Audio, Chicago recording studio. Steve has engineered by now probably thousands of records. He is well known for his strong, outspoken views concerning the music industry. Steve has been a frequent contributor to the music press 
and is a seminal figure in rock music of the past few decades. Steve, thank you very much for your participation today. Today's program, the theme relates to the creation of a music poster, more particularly to the conversation between artist and client, the source of artistic inspiration, technical processes involved in creation. Also, Jay and Steve, should be, you be willing, please tell us how decision, decisions are made concerning look, print run, and distribution. So I have a few questions I can ask you, but I know you guys get along very well together. So you can either start this thing as you see fit, or I can start it off with a couple of questions. I'm curious what your questions are. That's I am as well. Okay, what makes an effective poster? What makes a prize poster? What makes for a good client uh, for the graphic artist and for the musician? What constitutes a good poster and a good artist? Hmm. The first, the first part that I want to address of that is what makes for a good client. Uh, one of the reasons I hope to be able to include Steve in this conversation was because uh, between Steve and Bob Weston, also of Shellac, I think we've got two people who have commissioned uh, some, not only from me, but from other people as well, some good posters over the years because I think that they're, they're, uh, they're open to ideas. They like maybe suggesting maybe a theme um, without being overly uh, specific and they've got great senses of humor as far as uh what uh what they like to end up with uh in something that represents their band so that's something that i think a lot of uh, my favorite clients share as far as sort of a willingness to um let a poster maker make a poster and but but sort of be involved maybe in just a theme uh and i think we'll we'll probably talk a little bit more about that in my um, capacity as a client, what I try to do in relationships like that is, is um, I try not to use the the artist as a uh, kind of a, an, a robot. You know, like I I don't I don't tell Jay what to draw and then correct his drawing until it looks like I wanted it to look. Uh, I feel like that's a that's a rather crude way to execute something when you're dealing with somebody who has formidable talent. You, the, you know, in, in that case, an image or a poster can never be any better than your ideas. Um, and you know, if you're just, if you just expect somebody to execute your ideas, then you're limiting uh, the the possibility for something really interesting to happen. So, uh, I like the idea of. Uh, suggesting a topic or theme and then um, appreciating what the artist does. The other thing is I tend, I try very hard not to put any hard limits on something. Like if somebody wants to do something really ambitious, uh, I'm fine with that. But uh, if they want to do something dead simple, that's also fine. Um, generally, from uh, one of your questions was what makes for a good gig poster. And from the client's standpoint, um, the, the gig poster, it's great if it's engaging and that sort of thing, but if, it, if it's not functional, that is if you can't look at the poster and discern when the show is and which bands are playing, then it may have, you know, it, it may have succeeded as a piece of art, but it's failed as a poster. And what I appreciate about Jay's work as a client of Jay's is that he's played enough gigs as a musician that he knows that it's frustrating um, that people uh, can be standing in front of the advertisement for your show or the flyer for your show and not have enough information to make that make it to the gig. So um, a lot of that stuff is kind of unspoken. We don't, you know, uh, I don't need to remind him of that. Whereas people who come at it from the fine art uh, perspective, um, you you sometimes have to hold their hand through the process of conveying information. Um, the, the, the poster is meant to be an inform informational tool. It's meant to tell people what's going on and how they can see it. Um, then beyond that, having it be awesome is up to the artist. So Steve, question I have now is you mentioned uh, the possibility of suggesting, suggesting an idea for the creation of a poster. How closely aligned would your ideas be with the sound of the band or the, the, the uh there's there's a kind of in 
I mean, I'm speaking about the band that I'm in now, Shellac of North America. Like, there's a kind of a um, an identity for the band that's um, sort of extra musical, in that we're somewhat nerdy people in the band, and we have uh, minor obsessions that uh, that are expressed in ways other than the music. So uh, I, I would say the posters, especially, you know, that we're co-opting Jay's imagery and Jay's um, thought process, that's, that's external to the band. It's not, it's not, doesn't really hew very closely to the band identity. It's more of like, we're embracing this greater expression that includes Jay's creative process. So you, you, you both have highly developed senses of humor. How much of that is recognized in a poster? Or how, how much of what we see in a poster might be a joke, might be an inside joke? Um, there are jokes in all of them, I would say, right, Jay? I'd say that's probably true. Um, got, uh, uh, with that, I should probably roll into this, uh, into this slideshow, at least to start this. As we're talking, um, we can. I've, so what we're going to do is look at a handful of uh, the prints we've made, got to make for shellac over the last twenty odd years. Um, and I guess just sort of to lay a ground, a foundation. While I was working construction at your studio in the mid '90s, as the building was being built, um, I saw the artwork for this record, Terraform, that was coming out. Uh, saw these large, beautiful prints that were uh, paintings by Chesley Bonestell from, correct me if I'm wrong, late 50s, early 60s? Um, it, it was from a McCall's Magazine series that was later compiled into a book. It was a collaboration with Dr. Werner von Braun, the, the Nazi that we um, sort of co-opted into our space program to, to like head our early space program and missile program. Um, so he, in collaboration with him, they tried to like imagine what future space travel would look like and that these magazine articles and these images were, um, the, re the result of that collaboration and it had to be post-war, but, um, I don't remember, I don't remember how late it so, was. But the album cover, the, the album cover of the, the shellac record has a series of these paintings that basically in a broad sense, demonstrate astronauts traveling to another planet and making it habitable. There's a, there, you, were, you were asking about jokes. There's a kind of an inside joke just in the choice of this material. There, the, there's a, a, a concept that we've talked about called retrofuturism, where um, there are, these are sort of futuristic images, but the images themselves are from the past. So they're a kind of a, an ignorant perception, like they, like the the spacecraft are are all kind of uh, like appropriated, appropriating the 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 design of jet planes, which were like the very peak of. Um, aeronautical technology at the time. So they just assumed, well, spaceships are going to look like these jets because those are super futuristic as of right now. And, um, you know, deep sea diving was still being done in, you know, in these sort of canister helmet, lead booted uh, suits, isolate immersion suits. And so the space suits all look sort of like these deep sea diving suits. Um, and and that's a that's a theme that sort of plays out in the in the ba in the band in extra musical ways, where um, you're trying very hard to be forward thinking and falling flat on your face because you're frozen in these antiquated ideas. You know. So, carrying with that, let's you know extrapolating from that point, you know, when we get to Mars, what are we going to do? Um, so uh, this is Valentine's Day show 97. It's 97? Yeah, 90, 97. And uh, yeah, just like start to move out of uh, the adventures of space and, and sort of towards the mundane. Yeah, like um, once you get to your new planet, you, you have to fill your time somehow, yeah. So this was, I remember pulling this, uh, all this uh, chipboard out of a dumpster and hand cutting these with a yardstick on the floor of my loft uh in order to get them 
printed in order to take them over to Screwball and print them. I, I like the, the fact that the, the only um, St. Valentine's Day um, theme are the radiating electric hearts sort of um, on this alien landscape as though, as though that made any sense whatsoever. I'm very fond of that. Thank you. None of this makes sense. Uh, and then carrying that further, Shalek loves to do uh, sort of odd occasion shows, this playing, playing New Year's Eve at Lounge X and then playing first thing in the morning at Fireside Bowl uh, down Fullerton Avenue. And so again, we've got the, uh, the uh, astronauts planting trees. Why? Just so they have a place to hang up their sweaty suits. Yeah, the, um, the album that the space plane and stuff are, were the artwork for, the album was called Terraform. And as a verb, that means to take a planet and turn it into something habitable like Earth. And so on the, on the, the earlier image, you have the two astronauts planting the first plants on this new planet, like uh, let's say Mars. Um, because that's a, one of the steps in terraforming is you have to grow an atmosphere somehow and so you have to plant plants. And then the, the second image later, like uh, fantastic, these trees grew so, grew, so now we finally we have a clothesline, you know. I'm just noticing little details on here that I actually had totally forgotten about. So the small type in the lower left says, please do not ask Steve to play the immigrant song. I don't <laughs> know why I put that there. Anyway, um, yeah, and then, so then Shellac was going to do the West Coast tour. And I remember standing just outside the office that you're in right now at your studio and saying, oh, should we do some more astronauts? You said, yeah, but we also just wrote a song about squirrels. So maybe you could put a squirrel in there too. And so in my typical fashion of wanting to draw things too many times, uh, we put all these squirrels uh, uh, sort of continuing with the, the mundane. We've got uh, the one I, I always pictured the one as, as Todd swinging the, um, Todd the drummer um, swinging the toilet plunger for some reason. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I do, I like the, the um, one of the squirrels is wearing a, a top hat, which yeah, I- Yeah, just left of dead center. Yeah. Yeah. That's my favorite squirrel of the squirrels. Oh, thank you. Uh, he's fond of you as well. So, and then, uh, some years later, Shellac was going back to Australia. And so we had to put another astronaut situation there, except the art direction that I remember, I don't remember if this came from you or from Bob, but Bob, one the of dog you on the Tucker like, box. Yeah, it said, uh, we saw the dog on the Tucker box, look it up, we'd like to have that involved and maybe just some, some local animals. So um, yeah, 10 platypodes. Uh, which is the, the proper plural of platypus. Uh, You're kidding. No, I learned that in me. That's the kind of thing I learned doing my job. Uh -huh. A couple of drop bears, which they don't tell people out, uh, tourists about until you're in, in Texas, uh, Texas, Australia. <laughs> Steve, you know about drop bears, right? The three I'm, foot large carnivorous uh, koalas. I'm unfamiliar with drop bears. Okay. And now your, I'm learning stuff. Uh, ask your Australian friends, get involved. Um, yeah. Uh, and then uh, some uninfected uh, Tasmanian devils dismantling a snare drum, I think. But yeah, so the, so the dog on the Tucker box is like a poem written in like 1830 or something like that about a miner who's died and his dog is waiting with his lunchbox waiting for him to come yeah. back. Something he goes like down that. in the mine and dies, but his, and he walks to the mine with his dog every day and his dog guards his lunch pail. Um, and he's, you know, so when he comes up for lunch, he gets to play with his dog and then his dog can take the lunch pail home, right? But he goes down to the mine and the mine collapses and he dies. And then, the, so the dog just sat there and waited for the rest of his life. He just starved himself to death uh, waiting for, but by the, and so the, anyway, there's a monument to this dog on the Tucker box uh, uh, somewhere in Australia, uh, somewhere in the mine. My understanding that it's like, in the middle of nowhere though, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like having a, something in like Stull, Kansas or something like that, right? It's, it's no sort of like, sort of the equivalent of one of those giant ears of corn or like the big Paul Bunyan or whatever, you know, the, the, the big roadside pheasant, you know, like the Mars cheese castle, that kind of thing. 
Okay. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a, it's a tourist attra attraction uh, to an extent. <laughs> the, the whole thing is only about a yard high, so it, you wouldn't you wouldn't see it unless you went there to see it. So there's a, a kind of a visual pun. The tucker box in the original is like a, is sort of an old fashioned Australian metal lunch box in the, the monument that they made to the dog in the tucker box. And there's a, um, a kind of a fountain around it, uh, which it, that ring is, represents that sort of the sort of the moat around the dog in the tucker box. But the, the dog in the shellac poster is actually sitting on um, uh, a rendering of Bob, Bob and I use these amplifiers that we assembled into these big aluminum boxes. And uh, so uh, the dog is actually on, a, on top of one of our amplifiers instead of on top of an, uh, a Tucker box. Tucker is the Australian word for food, by the way. That's why ah. they're saying that. Now, now, see, I've learned something here as well. Uh, then there was a period where uh, we were, I was doing uh, drawings of some of the equipment around the studio, some microphones, a couple of the tape machines. Um, there was a print ad that ran somewhere at one point that I remember doing, but you uh, were determined to go on an all Wisconsin tour. So yeah. You to wear, be wearing cheese heads. Um, and uh, so this was a tour that, included visits to such exotic locations in Wisconsin, such as Minneapolis uh, and Reykjavik, Ice, Reykjavik uh, Iceland, which is part of Wisconsin. Yeah. But uh, this was printed on some really crazy uh, fancy paper uh, that I bought with Hans Seeger that uh, curled like crazy, but it's shiny, shiny and metallic, which was appropriate for the band's aesthetic. The the paper sort of looks like um, fingernail polish. It has this weird sort of iridescent, shimmery, shiny quality. I'm uh, I'm baffled as to how they managed that. Is that integral to the paper, or is it a coating on the paper? No, it's it is what the paper is. I I still to this day don't really know what it what it is or what it was. I I the technical side of printing on it was difficult, and uh, so I was not anxious to try and get more of it. But um, it also, as you can see from the image, um, it tends, the paper itself tended to uh, sort of gather scrapes uh, and bends pretty easily. So anyway, but that was fun, fun one to do. Um, another sort of pulling from a song, um, Shellac has a, a, song, a song called The End of Radio and in a simplified version, just basically it seems like a guy has wandered into a, a radio station and, and is broadcasting and isn't sure if anybody actually is hearing him. Um, but uh, this was a print that uh, has this radio tower and then superimposed over the horizon and the radio tower is um, a transparent uh, varnish of the Lomo logo, which is a Russian microphone logo. You guys kind of to some degree yeah, we, we adopted. Yeah. And, uh, uh, that's a kind of a theme with the band as well. Uh, I'm super charmed by that aspect of this poster. We we did some we did our t-shirt the first t-shirts that we sold as a band, um, and the only t-shirt that we had for about 25 years. Um, there were black t-shirts that were printed with a clear um, image of that logo, the Lomo logo, and the idea was that. Um, right after buying the shirt, you couldn't really even tell that it had anything printed on it. But as it aged, the rest of the t-shirt would fade and the bit under the shellac varnish that was printed on there, um, the bit under the varnish would not fade. And so over time, you would eventually be able to tell that it was a shellac shirt, but in the, uh, initially you wouldn't. And the idea there is like, we were all, we're all slightly uncomfortable with the idea of promotion, you know, of self-promotion. There's something a little bit sleazy about like uh, telling people um, to uh, or like promoting your band in any way. There's something like that we just have a visceral discomfort with. And that seemed like a very low key way to do it would be to, to like sort of let people learn over the course of 20 or 25 years that they were wearing a shirt that had your band's name on it, you know? So uh, that's uh, typical of the, the lifespan of uh, the expectations of patients involved in being a fan of shellac. Yeah. So 
And that, that one also has a hint of Russian constructivism to it too. A little bit of that, a little bit of uh, the futurism and the, uh, it's also I sort of composed a, um, a rambling uh, guy walks into a bar joke that I printed on the back of the poster. And then, so that's not even really something that you're gonna see. Oh, this is a really big print, by the way. This is 26 by 40 inches. Um, I love the- It was the fun to do. Time exp the long exposure starlight swirl. That's like a very, very specific thing. Like if, unless you've ever made long exposure images of the sky, you wouldn't know what was going on there. Um, it's not something that, you know, it's not like a, not something that people immediately recognize. And <clears throat> I was charmed by the thought of you having to make all of these little tiny concentric marks, uh, you know. Uh, I just took a long time making the poster. That's all. That's know. how it worked. And then, uh, so then uh, you put out a record with this. I never really found out the origin of this photo, but you've got this, this, record called dude incredible with this awesome photo did bob take this who took no that photo i just stumbled across that photo somewhere it's a, a reuters news service photo um and it shows monkeys fighting and i i can't i don't i'm not really sure what the context of it was i think it was that it was like um monkeys kind of exploiting human society by like becoming like integrated into a city so they were like sort of part of the cityscape but then they would still have their normal monkey interactions like here's one monkey throwing another monkey off a cliff kind of um interesting printmaking detail this was printing this picture of monkeys on paper was the most difficult print job our record label ever had to pull off it <laughs> took for fucking ever <laughs> We got the artwork finished and put together and we started in on the printing process and it was literally a calendar year before we had an acceptable version of the printed monkeys on paper. Uh, I'll just give you a brief description of it. The, the paper, the chipboard is this rough corrugated, not corrugated, but rough um, recy recycled chipboard, uh, which has a lot of texture to it, like visual texture and also physical texture. And the idea w was that we wanted to have this crisp, bright photographic picture uh, sort of embedded in this coarse, uh, slightly cheap material that the, the album jacket was, was made out of. Like uh, in a way kind of drawing attention to both the physical texture of the, of the paper by like removing that texture and uh, removing that core, that sort of undulation in the imagery, like so the image would be bright and crisp and flat, but the, the album that you're holding was kind of soft and pliable and textured, right? In order to do that, we had to paint, we had to print a white, opaque white ground on which we could then print the color image of the monkeys. And then that whole thing would be because the monkeys were then printed on top of a shiny, hard, white ground, they would the image would be prone to scratching off or whatever wouldn't wouldn't be embedded into the paper. So it would need to be then coated with a varnish to protect it. And uh, every single step of that process absolutely baffled every printer we took it to like no one had ever done it before people were convinced it was impossible um, i have somewhere in in my flat files i have dozens of rejected experimental attempts at printing monkeys on paper but you know our perseverance is such that even if it takes a fucking year uh, to do something that is as conceptually simple as printing monkeys on paper um, we're, we're willing to tough it out. Like we don't, there's no release schedule as far as we're concerned. It's a, another example of how shellac sort of plays, makes up their own rules. And, uh, I wanted to, uh, have that reflected in this, uh, show with other Chicagoans bear claw playing over at Lincoln hall. So it's sort of mimicking, uh, the one monkey throwing another monkey off a cliff. We've got callbacks to astronauts and, uh, platypus and squirrels and penguins uh, from other images. Uh, one of the 
characters is wearing a t-shirt that says chooch which is uh <laughs> uh slang in our uh nerd peer group um it comes from but, the italian if you if there's a chooch in your family a chooch means donkey and, and it's somebody that can't take care of himself and everybody else in the family has to like pull his weight for him and it's a common insult in our social circle is to call somebody a chooch and then, uh, of course, Stephen Soley uh, holding a fish above his head. So, uh, so during, the, his, during his mustache years. Yeah, the, you, Kevin, you'd asked about the, the jokes and inside jokes. There's like a triple layer inside joke embedded in that one little subtlety of Stephen Soley holding a fish over his head. Uh, one, one of the proposed but unused album titles that Shellac had was Bears at Rest, Bears at Work, or Play. And as is typical with us, an idea doesn't just pop into existence without having a whole backstory. So the idea behind that was that we would have images of our bass player, Bob Weston, wearing a bear suit uh, going through a, a bunch of mundane human activities, but as a bear, right? And one of those mundane human activities was meant to be him in a movie theater, you know, reclining, watching a movie in a movie theater, but instead of having a bag of popcorn, he would have a salmon with him, right? Uh, so that was, that whole conversation played out in front of Jay. I can't remember if, if it was on, while we were on tour with his, Jay's band or if it was just, uh, you know, conversation in some other context, but he managed to find a, a spot to have somebody holding a salmon in one of, our, one of our posters. That's an inside joke in the sense that literally only the three of us in the band, Jay and whoever he had had, had to explain it to so far, would know what the context of that salmon was. Yeah, well, it's out of the bag now. Yeah. And there's a, uh, I don't know what it's called exactly, but a, a level there for a surveyor uh, yeah. touching on one of the songs. Anyway. Um, the Adelaide. That's, uh, I I think that that's all the, the shellac images that I have to share with you today. Um, and uh, we're about to, we've got, uh, I think I counted, I think I've done 19 posters for you over the years, but I think these are the ones that have the most uh, to say about them. And uh, I think I've recorded a half a dozen sessions with you in one form or another, have I not? Some, some, uh, something on that scale? Something around there, yeah, probably. Uh, going back to before you were a famous poster artist, when you were uh, in uh, a scrabbly punk band called Hubcap. That was uh, an exciting time. So yeah. uh, it was um, 1994, I think, was the first time that I got to record with you. So, so uh, I have a couple of questions. Can I ask questions or is that? Absolutely. Please. There's a thing that you do. Uh, this poster, the image that's up now, is a, is a really good example of it. You, there's a thing that you do that um, I, uh, I have a, a tiny smidgen of printmaking experience. So I recognize this thing um, where you've, you've broadened the color palette by superimposing one color over another to synthesize a third color that is an admixture of those two, right? Correct. So yep. um, you can see there's the kind of uh, lavender ham color. And then there's the, the sort of uh, lemon sorbet color. And um, my presumption is that those two superimposed make this the sort of peachy orange or sort of um, ochre color. Is that correct? While we were talking, I was actually looking at this poster and trying to figure out some of the math that I did on this, whatever that would be six and a half years ago. Um, I believe that the bright hazard orange uh, that's for the, the band name probably printed first, I'm guessing, and then underprints the, the square that's um, in the middle of the image with the green printed on top of it, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing that the sort of watermelon uh, bubblegum pink, which is not the purplish lavenderish, but the bubblegum pink. The ham tone. Uh, ham tone is 
combined with the yellow of the penguin and the platypus to make the orange but I can't guarantee that. And I'm not really sure. I guess there's also the purplish ham tone, but I don't know so, by what math I got from that to. So Stephen Soley's kind of um, uh, sort of. His shirt is. Pride uh, sort of deep lavender. That's the, do you, do you reckon that that's the sort of cyan background color plus the watermelon ham tone? That's my guess. That's my guess. Yeah. This is this so, question though is a good transition to the second half of our hour, um, which we'll get to in a minute. Where 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 uh, that I've worked on the last couple of days, showing specifically how I layer colors. Oh, fantastic! Um, oh, fantastic. So if you if you're able to stick around, uh, I would love to uh, show you that segment in a in a minute. Do you have any other questions or complaints at this time, Mr. Steve? No. I wanted, to draw, or I, wanted to draw, I wanted to draw the viewer's attention to, to a couple of subtleties about Jay's visual style that are um, among the things that keep us going back to Jay. Um, if you notice the characters and the images uh, uh, in Jay's prints, all of them have a very warm, sort of casual quality. Um, uh, there's a, I mean, I don't know if this is still true, but for a while there was a, there was a fairly strong uh, trend in poster imagery, especially for rock bands and, and such, for using these very chiseled, hard-edged, chiaroscuro, sort of like strong contrast, uh, like noirish images, and uh, that kind of became a kind of a self caricature where like basically every poster had you know a, a pistol or a dagger and some dice and a devil chick and some flames and, and and that that sort of imagery just played itself out in a way that that it, it made posters kind of indistinguishable one from the next like they were all sort of meant to imply drinking whiskey and uh, having fights and getting rockabilly tattoos and things of that nature. And what I like about Jay's choice of characters and his imagery is that um, they're not diametric to that, but they're things that, you're, that you would want to hang out with, not things that would be intimidating to you. And, that, and they're like, I could imagine having a lovely afternoon with any of the characters or creatures in Jay's posters. And I think that's the things that keeps, keeps us coming back is that the, the sort of uh, menagerie seems so inviting uh, as a cast of characters, you know? The other one is that there's a very handmade quality to everything about Jay's artwork the individual letters of the text are drawn one after another, as opposed to him developing a typeface and then you know, having the typeface typeset onto his artwork. He, he draws the letters. Each letter is a separate rendering of a piece of, of I, the idea. And uh, that to me speaks to his sort of complete engagement with the poster as a medium rather than it being I'm going to draw a picture and put some type on it. It's he's drawing the entire thing as a as a single coherent piece of art, you know. Uh, so those are those are the things that the sort of craftsmanship, I guess you'd call it, or dedication or a sort of consistency of the aesthetic. Um, but and as detailed and as carefully as say the color mapping is done, and, and I understand we're gonna be learning more, and more about that in a minute, and that excites me on a, on a visceral level. Um, the casual aspect of it is also um, very important to us. A lot of his renderings are done in pencil and the sort of um, preliminary strokes of the pencil uh, are still visible inside or outside of the final form and that, that reminds you that the process is not one of exact execution. It's a, a kind of a, um, 
a gradual settling on a place and on, on a shape and on a on a character and on a facial expression. It's not these aren't ideas that leap into existence. They have to be sort of coaxed, um, you know, centimeter by centimeter. You have to get it right as you go along. And I love the fact that we as viewers are allowed to see these sort of tentative and experimental gestures that are part of the part of the drawing process as opposed to being part of a, a kind of an abstract uh, image, you know, there we're we're seeing how we got there, which I, I think is it's a rare admission from an artist. Like most artists want people to think of their work as being perfectly realized. And what I one of the, the warmest aspects of Jay's art is that we're a, allowed to see that it took him a little effort to get to the final form. That's a very generous way of saying I'm fumbling around now, and I occasionally stop. So, so may I, let me ask a question on behalf of the archival community and the Chicago collections. But Steve, you asked Jay about the colors and the overlapping colors, what, what's involved in doing that. Um, Jay, could anyone go into those files behind you at some point in the future and find out exactly how you made that, what colors you chose, uh, how you Not did it? And Steve, in, in, in recording, in engineering, are you keeping records that document the step-by-step -step process of, of your work? In the, as far as recording is concerned, the um, there's a session document called the track sheet that's live for the duration of the session where everything that's recorded is documented. So you'll have a fairly complete record of what was recorded using what equipment, you know, using what microphone. And um, there's a, a you know, one of the, the nice things about the analog method, which is what I use, is that at the end of the method, at the end of the session, there's a box that has a reel of tape and the track sheet and notes in it. And you can put that box on a shelf. And then in a hundred years, you can take it down off the shelf, open the box and you have everything you need to resurrect the session completely uh, as it was when you were last working on it. That's a, that's a critical part of my process a critical part of the appeal of analog recording is that from an archival standpoint, it's much, much more durable than just having some files on a drive somewhere. Thanks. For my aspect, just off out of camera over here on this other shelf, I've got boxes that contain all the films for everything I've ever printed, which are basically, we'll, we'll cover it in a second, but it's the, the equivalent of a photo negative um, if you want to print more 35 millimeter photos, you pull your negative out and you can put it back into your photo enlarger and print more photos. In this case, I, I don't because it's not part of my business plan or business practice, but should I for some reason want to print something from 1996, it will take several hours of digging through boxes, but I can find the films, re-expose screens and mix ink pretty close to whatever I used at whatever time and try and um, th in theory could uh, make uh, remake prints, um, which is uh, not something I do, uh, but the possibility exists. So um, on that note, I know that we're, we're sort of past time wise where we wanted to be. Let me um, jump to this other, oops, okay. Let me, um, jump from there, if you don't mind, into this, uh, this other bit of work that I've been working on. Uh, as Steve was mentioning, sort of trying to figure out what it is that I'm working on, uh, setting, not setting out with a clear goal. Uh, I wanted to make a simple small print that I could share with everybody here. Uh, so I started with a small drawing that's about six by 12 inches. Uh, won't come as any big surprise. It ended up being a bear and a rabbit drinking coffee, um, which I think is sort of ground that I've covered before, but I was feeling it the other, the other day. So uh, ended up uh, inking this one as opposed to going the pencil route because I wanted to nice crisp lines, keep things clear for this demo. And we've got a finished drawing there that uh, everything hatched in and some high contrast areas in the background and between the logs. So. What I typically do uh, is then, what, no, excuse me. 
What I typically do now is I will often make my separations these next couple steps in Photoshop, sort of drawing by hand on my trackpad. But uh, when I do my demonstrations uh, like this, I like to go back to the way that I've worked for years, which is cutting ruby lith. So this is a film that's been spit out of the computer. You could have made this on a photocopier. You could have made this on a stat machine back in the day, um, but uh, photostat camera. But um, that's what we're doing uh, computers now. And so this is a piece of ruby lith. Ruby lith is a two layers of plastic. It's a clear acetate on the bottom and a red mylar on the top. And so I take this sheet. I know that Steve has used this in the past. Um, this used to be uh, how newspapers get laid out. You'd be, you'd be called a stripper by being in charge of pasting up a newspaper. So what I'm doing here is uh, taping this sheet of ruby lift down over that film. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that this film, we're gonna call it the key plate. It's gonna print last and it's, gonna, it's obviously it's just all the outlines. So put this ruby lift down, I'm coming with my gigantic X-Acto knife here at the bottom and I cut just through the red mylar, but not through the clear acetate and start to define shapes and peel up sections of ruby lift and start to define areas that will and won't be printed. So in the end, what I've got here is a film on the right-hand side that is going to be the shape of the first screen. Um, so I take this, uh, that's, that's my, my first film. Here's the print shop where I'm sitting. I'm sitting right next to that uh, fern on the, on the left-hand side there, but my press and drying racks and a whole bunch of stuff in boxes. Uh, this is my dark room. We call it the red light district. Uh, the screens are stored in there in the dark and uh, they're coated with, it's a, it's a, a um, metal frame uh, stretched with a synthetic polyfiber mesh. It used to be silk, which is why it's called silk screen printing, but it's um, coated with, in this case, a green photosensitive emulsion. That emulsion goes on wet and then stays in the dark room and dries. And once it's dry, the emulsion is water soluble as long as it stays in the dark. Once it, get, once it gets exposed to bright light for a period of time, it becomes non-water soluble. So uh, as people have noted, I use only the most high-tech equipment here at the shop. Everything's cutting edge, such as my exposure unit here, which is a piece of glass off a coffee table and a couple of halogen work lights. And my over here on the left, you've got my imported Swedish printing weights. Um, put that film down on top of the piece of glass and then the screen with the photo emulsion goes on top. When the lights down here turn on, all of this green emulsion is going to react and become non-water soluble, except for the area that's blocked by that film. So I put a piece of felt, pile a couple of my imported Swedish printing weights on there. There's a close up of this, the, the imported Swedish printing weights, very fancy. You can't get those anymore. And then uh, I take the whole uh, screen once it's been exposed for seven or eight minutes, take it over to the murder tub, here, I'm sorry, spray out booth and uh, spray water on it. And what we end up with is a green plasticky non-porous surface and then open mesh perfectly in the shape of the film that was cut. And so once that dries, I turn around and I head over to the press. This is my press, which is like the size and cost of a 1995 Subaru. Uh, that's the press closed. It's also behaving like a 1995 Subaru because I've got all the panels open because I had to replace the brushes on the motors recently. I haven't put it all back together. So the press is closed, press is open. And so I take that screen that I just burned and mount it into the master frame here, get it all lined up with paper underneath and then we go to mix some ink. Uh, I use Speedball acrylic screen printing ink. Everything is water-based, it's non-toxic. Uh, the main color we're gonna print here is a transparent magenta. So it's magenta with a bunch of transparent base mixed into it. And then a little bit of uh, chocolate, uh, chocolate brown, milk, milk chocolate brown ink there on the left-hand side. So I basically, screen printing is like, it's like uh, having a box of eight crayons and just sort of really being good at using eight crayons. There's only, there's very few things that you can do. Uh, I've got two good tricks that I like to use. One of them is uh, a gradient. Uh, split fountain is the technical term. Um, 
And it's that instead of adding a single color to the screen to print, we'll add one color and then add another color to sort of roll together. So if you're very careful and measure very specifically like I have here, um, you can pour some ink onto the screen. You've got the squeegee up there, which is a polyurethane blade sort of made like, like out of Steve's rollerblade wheels. Um, and, uh, and so ink goes on there, the press, oh, I'm sorry, and I shall also mention the paper. The paper that I use is all um, made from recycled stock in Niles, Michigan, 130 year old family owned company called French Paper made using hydroelectric power. Um, so it gets registered against this red tape um, by hand, I put in a sheet of paper in there, press closes, uh, the squeegee comes forward and presses down on the image and pulls back. And you can see the red area here where the ink has gone through the screen. When we're printing, printing a split fountain, at first it doesn't end up looking too graceful. It's a little bit smudged. We've got a real hard, abrupt edge here. But after a handful of prints, end up with a nice gradient uh, going from brown up into this transparent magenta. So that's the first color on one piece, except I'm gonna make like 150 of these. There's some rabbits. And uh, now the prints are dry. So they air dry in uh, about, uh, air dry to the touch in 10 or 15 minutes. So there's one color. So I go ahead and reclaim the screens, take the emulsion out, power wash it out end up with a nice new screen. Cut the second film, which is gonna be basically the shape of the bear and the leaves and the logs, but not the rabbit, contrasting with what we had in the first screen. That gets burned to its own screen, gets set up in the press. We're gonna do another gradient. We're gonna do my other trick. We've got, as I mentioned, printing uh, gradients or a split fountain is one of my tricks. The other one is uh, mixing a lot of transparent base into the ink. So that when I lay one color on top of another, as Steve was talking about before in that bear claw poster, we'll get a different color. We'll get uh, secondary colors. So we've got uh, yellow here on the right, and then technically a really dark yellow on the left, yellow with a bunch of black in it and a bunch of transparent base. So that again, if you're you know very scientific quantities measured onto the screen, roughly one blorp onto the screen. And we end up, this is what that, that print looks like just on paper. So you got the yellow on the top and sort of the darker Dijon yellow on the bottom. However, we're actually printing on top of what was already there. So that's where we're getting with uh, two colors, two screens. So we've gone, we've got an orange up between the characters. We've got the pink, the yellow. Both of those characters fade darker as they get down below. And then the, uh, the logs are sort of more brownish greenish. So there they are with two color, two screens down. This always seems to catch people off guard, but that key plate itself then goes on to the, uh, onto the exposure unit and get, gets burned into its own screen. On the right, we've got straight black ink, uh, which I rarely, rarely use. On the left is, it looks to be pretty light gray in this context, but that's usually more of the color of gray that I use as my outlines. Here it looks really light, but once it gets onto the screen, there you can see the, the uh, print registered. That's a little loose registration there against the tape, but underneath the screen and as the print runs, then uh, that's the finished print. So uh, celebrating this last week, this uh, warm November, uh, we got some some buddies uh, bucking some firewood and uh, drinking coffee. So there's that, um, and that's uh, how to make a three screen print in a nutshell. Um, got a handful of other things that want to see what we're doing for time. So I've got five minutes left. Um, you can see the gradients, like in that last print, uh, for example, in this one. Uh, this is my cat is 20 years old. She told me about a dream she had one time recently. And so this is a dream that Akiko had um, with her deceased brother and some other friends um, 
swimming with orcas. You can see in the background here, we've got a gradient. It's very subtle going from this blue up to the screen here. Um, again, uh, more gradients. In this particular case, this, this uh, show, our friends in HUM uh, played during the Gulf oil spill in 2010. And so the, the uh, speckling in the background behind this turtle, uh, I actually spray painted on the films uh, physically spray painted on the films during the cutting the ruby lith process. Felt like that worked out pretty well. This is a really good example. That turtle is a really good example of being able to see the preliminary strokes. Um, if you look around the the flippers and around the where the internal construction of the turtle is put together, you can see that there are some sort of slightly hesitant uh, sort of blocking lines around the shape of the turtle. And what what I love about that is that it doesn't have any effect on your perception of the turtle. It just uh, gives you, uh, it takes, it puts you in the mind of the person having to draw the turtle. Like, how the fuck do you make a flying turtle? I guess you'd have to make their little flippers stick up in this way. And then you can, uh, um, I'm very, very, very fond of that effect. It happens again and again in Jay's prints. Thank you. I've, I've uh, recently gotten on this kick of trying to draw very cleanly just recently. And uh, I'm, I also still I'm, have something in the works right now that sort of counteracts everything that I've been doing recently and is fully, uh, fully embraces the, uh, the pencil aspect. But uh, another recent one, sort of more, more monochromatic art directed by uh, my buddy Rob Jones. Uh, print for Andrew Bird, uh, showing good example of the uh, transparency, the ink, uh, printing uh, layering ink to get uh, subtle shifts in color. And uh, like to try and, I think this is one of the first prints I made after the inauguration in 2017. Um, let's put our heads together, um, just sort of, I think a lot of people were making appropriately negative uh, work at that point, um, reflecting socio-political situation. Um, I wanted to try and find some positive spins to, uh, to present. So there's just a bunch of people taking care of each other. Um, I love layering stuff and drawing a lot of things like a lot of squirrels or a lot of blades of grass or a lot of things that are you'd find in your closet or a lot of blades of grass. We started, it's uh, barely November and already we started about talking about when we're gonna order seeds for what we're gonna plant in the spring. And of course, uh, I like to promote the use of ice cream and the dismantling of white supremacy as much as possible. All right, I think we're coming up on the end of our time here. Uh, Kevin, what, what other, what would you like to, have us uh, have Steve and I talk about or explain. This has been great. You two are fabulous. This has just been a, a marvelous program. Um, I don't have anything to, to add. I don't know. I don't know that I can top what you've already done. So thank you both for this wonderful presentation. Very illuminating, very informative and a whole lot of fun. Thank, thank you. Well, thanks. thanks for having us. Really thanks to Jeannie uh, at Chicago Collections also for having us. One thing I should mention is I just uh, while we were talking, just posted that print that I made with the uh, the um, rabbit the and the bear. Those are up at thebirdmachine.com right now if anybody's interested in those. So, uh, you can bet. So yeah, actually, Kevin, can you take can you take just a minute and explain to those who don't know maybe what the Chicago Collections Consortium is all about? Yeah, Chicago Collections Consortium is a, a, a group of Chicago area institutions, cultural institutions associated with uh, libraries or collecting library and archival type material. And our mission is to promote the use of historical uh, resources, to educate the, the public, to, to uh, get people to use the wonderful collections that are available in this region, and to encourage our members to uh, contact individuals like you, because as I said earlier, you are witnesses to history, you are creating history, 
uh, you are people of great significance in this community. And, and uh, uh, part of the reason to have you on was to, was to remind the people who are uh, associated with Chicago Collections that wonderful work is being done here in this area. And uh, uh, there are great opportunities for our members to uh, communicate with each other and communicate with people like you to better document our time. Well, thank you for having us today. And Steve, right. thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. Like I, like I said, when I was asked, I like Jay and I like talking. So this is right in my wheelhouse. <laughs> we, we, we enjoyed hearing you talk. Thank you all very much.